Thank you, Arne, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me here, you know, that, that you host the uh, old man, it's very nice, <laughs> Still among uh, all the young people here. <coughs> Actually, you know, I must say that uh, for us it's a little bit for all, uh, for the old people, a little bit of a revival <laughs> going through this field. I was just talking to uh, Benny uh, Brown, my uh, former postdoc, we worked 20 years ago on subjects which we uh, see now, you know, popping up again, and it's uh, quite nice uh, <laughs> to have this experience. Well, anyway, I had uh, uh, chosen a very uh, generic title here because I didn't really know what I will talk about and whether I will get through my slides, so uh, I, I apologize for that, but it will become clear in a moment. So I should uh, acknowledge here my uh, collaborators, in particular uh, Koki Nakata, he is also sitting here. Uh, actually, do you have a poster? <coughs> okay, yeah. that's great. Uh, on what? <laughs> <laughs> because then I will reduce my stuff. <laughs> uh, okay, not because I changed the talk. So, uh, <laughs> well, fine. Anyway, uh, so you will hear the details, uh, or you can go then to uh, Koki and get uh, some more details. And uh, I should also uh, acknowledge my former uh, students, PhD students, uh, Kevin uh, van Hochtelum. Uh, so we see him did a lot on. Uh, spin chain work in this system and uh, he's now back uh, to Delft and uh, Pascal Simon is whom I worked uh, uh, over the years a lot on it and uh, of course uh, Jaroslav uh, you know we recently had also some work in this area <coughs> with uh, Kevin and uh, with Jelena she uh, recently joined uh, our activities here as a new faculty hire in uh, Basel. Okay good so uh, first I would like to talk uh, a little bit more about the pure quantum and uh, go then from there more uh, to the uh, semi-classical description of uh, magnetism, magnon transport in uh, insulating bulk magnets. And uh, for this I also go a little bit back in time. Actually it's a paper from 2003 and I'm not afraid to show it now because I have seen that Jaroslav had a paper by himself he showed this morning from 2002. <laughs> 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 so I think it's fine, right? Uh, you, uh, I will not hear any bad comments. <coughs> uh, but still, I think, uh, you know, this was one of uh, our Gedanken experiments at that time to say, is there some uh, spectacular feature which one could uh, hope to see if you deal just with spin transport? And uh, we were a little bit naive uh, at that time, just uh, saying, okay, uh, let's just drive a current and uh, do not really uh, you know, worry how actually to drive the current, just if the current is driven by something and that is something now we understand better, uh, could be uh, some sort of a uh, local chemical potential which you generate or by spin batteries uh, as worked out by uh, you know, uh, Jaroslav and his uh, collaborators Arne and um, Harry Bauer. Then uh, it's possible to get some kind of a non-equilibrium situation where you have on the left uh, uh, side of a reservoir uh, kind of a higher chemical potential and uh, then on the right or vice versa. And uh, we, we are interested then to ask <coughs> what is the transport property if you go through a single quantum chain. And uh, there are uh, very distinctive uh, differences between a uh, anti-ferromagnetic spin chain and a ferromagnetic uh, spin chain. And uh, I just want to flash this here. So the Hamiltonian uh, is rather simple, uh, Heisenberg uh, exchange interaction. And if uh, J is uh, positive, then we have a uh, uh, anti-ferromagnet and uh, vice versa ferromagnet <coughs> and apply the magnetic field. And so we are interested now in this current and we are interested in the uh, conductance that means uh, the uh, uh, conductivity of a finite system. Okay, so uh, uh, to treat this uh, problem is actually rather easy uh, for a uh, 1D uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic chain for a spin one half because then you can map everything exactly uh, to spin less fermions. So by jordan wigner transformation, basically you just go back to a fermionic language and that was the motivation where we came from because there we know if you have a single channel, uh, it takes, uh, you know, only you can only take a certain amount of uh, charges going through the uh, channel. And uh, very similar here now too, uh, what is the amount you get through and this is uh, measured then uh, by the uh, conductance or conductivity and uh, the spin current uh, is then uh, proportional uh, to the uh, basically to the field difference or the chemical potential difference between uh, the two sides and it drives a, uh, a current and uh, this uh, conductance for the anti-ferromagnetic chain uh, essentially takes in this kind of universal value g mu bore squared over h and if you compare this with electrons then uh, the coupling constant E 
the charge is now replaced by G mu bore. So it's a square because uh, you transport the G mu bore and the coupling constant to the field is a G mu bore. And that's why in linear response you get a square. That's the same as the charge. And uh, you know, there is an H bar in there. And this is uh, usually the test where you can see whether quantum mechanics is really responsible. <coughs> if you put h bar to zero, you get uh, a problem here. You see something changes. And in many other uh, aspects <coughs> of uh, magnonic uh, behavior, h bar doesn't really play a role. I mean, it's just uh, you know lumped into an energy uh, 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 difference uh, of Zeeman energy, h bar omega or something like this. And then it's kind of a classical unit. But here, very clearly, that is a uh, quantum unit. N is the number of uh, channels. <coughs> that means uh, if I uh, would put now such uh, <coughs> wires in a, in, a, in a material into parallel, then uh, they should just add up. Unfortunately, it's not completely uh, uh, universal, uh, apart from the G factor anyway, uh, because it also matters now how the outside reservoir carries the magnons. And that's also well known in uh, fermionic systems that you have a transition from a Fermi liquid when you go to a one-dimensional channel uh, could be a Lattinger liquid or not, that uh, there is uh, the, uh <coughs> the uh, behavior outside determines actually what the uh, charge conductance is inside because all the conductance is coming from the entrance. It doesn't matter what is inside if you have no disorder in there. This is uh, basically just point contact resistance. So you have a magnon and this magnon, uh, once it makes it through that door, it has to pay this minimum resistance of uh, G mu Bohr squared over H. <coughs> Okay, if you go to a ferromagnet, then the situation is uh, uh, completely different in the sense that uh, it now strongly depends on temperature. And if you go to low temperatures, so if this here uh, 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 goes to, uh, I mean, zero temperature, then you see that uh, this expression here becomes proportional to temperature and it vanishes with vanishing temperature. So the conductance disappears for a ferromagnet. It's a very distinct distinction now between a ferro and an anti-ferromagnet. <coughs> So the quantized value, uh, I think, is an impressive uh, uh, result uh, here. And uh, yeah, OK, yeah, I said this already. Now, uh, Yaroslav mentioned that <coughs> also someone said that uh, one can actually uh, detect of a moving dipole electric fields. And that's also something we were thinking about 25 years ago in other contexts. And I think 50 years ago, Tony Leggett was thinking about that. And Russians were thinking about that. So it's, a, it's kind of a very interesting old uh, issue. On the other hand, uh, it's also clear that the effect must be tiny because it's a relativistic effect. So you have a magnetic uh, dipole moment in the rest frame, and if that moves and you boost it back to the uh, lab frame, then uh, you pay an a, a c squared here, 1 over c squared essentially, and that makes it uh, a very small. Is it negligible? Well, actually, you can add it up. So uh, we made then uh, some estimates based on this uh, 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 transport uh, conductance. And basically, you have a magnetic dipole field, which in the rest frame uh, translates into an electric dipole field. And so if the current flows in this direction, your magnetic moments are uh, along the set direction, then you get an electric field perpendicular, uh, maximally perpendicular to it. And that uh, creates then basically a voltage. And uh, if you add many of those transverse channels, so here's a number uh, playing around with this, let's say 10 to 4 or so, then uh, you get a signal uh, which is very small across this wire. But very small does not mean it's not measurable. This is actually, we, we chose a value uh, which is uh, measurable uh, these days by uh, squids. And uh, you could have the sensitivity to measure it. Now, you could ask, why should I go through those pains and measure this signal? Because uh, there might be other ways to measure the spin current, as uh, you know, here now. On the other hand, I think it would be fundamentally very interesting to do an experiment like that, just to see, you know, that it's true or not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, a, a simple naive question. Suppose you have a purely static, uh, twisted spin configuration without magnons in the ground state. Yeah. Would you still expect that it generates an electric field or not? No. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying this. I'm saying, you know, I need a magnon which yeah. goes. Right. I need a magnetic I moment I which flows, on. right? Yeah. If the magnetic moment is completely constant, then nothing changes. But right. if you have a uh, spin chain where uh, you have a uh, turning of the magnetization, then of course, it, you know, yeah. locally I see a change of, uh, of my magnons. I see a change of the magnetization. So in this sense, uh, I think I would say it's... Yeah, I, mean, I think it's allowed by symmetries. Yeah. And uh, physically, that spin current is actually spin current. It's carried by uh, some d orbitals or whatever, but it's physically spin current. I mean, it's probably, you know, this, this is applicable even to that spin current. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, uh, okay, so in this model, you basically can think of a domain wall, let's say, for an antiferromagnet. And that's the elementary excitation. You know, that's just, uh, uh, basically, that's, any, that's the thing, it's a spin-on, it's not even a magnon, uh, which uh, goes for your system. It's very well uh, localized also in space. And there are actually materials, uh, strontium copper oxide materials, which come as chains. So I'm not even asking you as an experimentalist to fabricate that, just take a chain to the bulk system and then uh, by changing the temperature, having a higher temperature outside than inside, you can couple or decouple the chains. Because there's also a cluster chains coupling, if the temperature is larger than that uh, cluster chain coupling, then you decouple them. So I think uh, you're still waiting uh, for some experimentalists to look into it. Now the spin currents, uh, they are also uh, affected by the electric field and that goes uh, via the iron of uh, Kasher phase. And I also would like to point this out. So uh, basically we know if you have a magnetic uh, uh, monopole charge, then uh, it couples to an electric field like an electric uh, uh, monopole charge couples to a magnetic field. <coughs> but now you have a dipole field uh, of a magnetic uh, 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 charge and uh, that gives rise to this uh, aronoff kasher effect. <coughs> that uh, means if you have an electric field, then a uh, uh, magnetic dipole which moves in that electric field picks up a phase. And this uh, phase you can uh, include as a piles hopping phase uh, in the spin chain. So if you go to the uh, representation of, uh, of, the, of this uh, spin chain of S plus and S minus, and if you chain, uh, change the uh, spin, then you pick up this phase here. <coughs> Then so doing it's, <coughs> it's the prefactor is, is not the same G as uh, G factor, right? Because you have this, uh, this Thomas procession or whatever. This one, yeah, 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 yeah. Some, yeah. some correction. So let make a tilde G over it, G yeah. Tilde, yeah, okay. yeah. And then uh, let's say in the simplest magnon expansion, this uh, phase then translates down into an effective uh, gauge potential, which is now uh, uh, expressed in terms of the electric field. And once you have this Hamiltonian, you can also look then uh, just at the force created by this. Uh, uh, gauge potential, so you just look at the Heisenberg equation of motion, take this Hamiltonian double commutator and you get this force. And the force is now uh, uh, acting on the dipole, it's just given as a gradient in space over the magnetic field and this additional uh, electric field. So you need an electric field which varies in space in order to get a uh, force acting on your dipole moments. And it's actually quite amazing how simple this field can be. So if this field is just uh, uh, linear in, uh, in the coordinates, that means uh, it corresponds to a harmonic potential, an electrostatic harmonic potential, then uh, you get an effective field which uh, plays then the role of, uh, of a, a quantum hold field of a magnetic flux field, uh, which is also a gauge potential which is linear. Uh, in the position. <coughs> and uh, with this you can then extend, uh, let's say going from uh, 1D to 2D and uh, look for example at spin currents in electric fields and look for a whole effect uh, and uh, indeed if you have a field gradient, a magnetic field gradient, so it's a two-dimensional uh, system let's say with magnons and or, or, or the spinons have a magnetic field perpendicular which has a gradient uh, along the uh, x direction and an electric field, which uh, is of the form I just showed before, in the plane, then uh, there is a force acting on the magnetic dipole moment, which uh, is driven now in the direction of increasing chemical potential uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the dipole moment. And then there is a force acting on it perpendicular, this Lorentz force, and uh, the magnets get deflected at the uh, boundary here. They build up some uh, 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 additional uh, kind of uh, chemical potential and then there is a backflow and in a stationary situation you get a whole effect. So you can calculate then the whole effect, uh, the whole current uh, basically is again you move uh, g mu bore, uh, the certain density with a velocity in x direction and that's the current uh, which we are looking at and this current then has a, a whole uh, conductance which uh, is expressed now in terms of g mu bore instead of E and uh, also the uh, magnetic field here is replaced by the uh, electric field gradient. And then of course a very natural question uh, you can ask, can that value be quantized? Can we go into something which is analogous to a uh, quantum hole uh, effect? And so now here uh, I uh, interrupt a little bit the story, I come back to it uh, hopefully if I have enough time. And then I'll tell you what we found recently. I would just uh, <coughs> go on a little bit and tell you that one can also think of spin devices in the strong quantum limit. I didn't want to say much about this, but when I listened then to Jaroslav's uh, talk, I uh, 
made a few slides <laughs> <laughs> just uh, to show that uh, this kind of uh, transistor <coughs> behavior uh, already happens or can happen in a uh, strong or in a deep quantum regime. So Yaroslav uh, was uh, making a nice point about chirality, that uh, if you have a system with chirality in there, then you can use this system uh, for devices. And uh, we looked at the uh, system where the chirality has basically its minimum. So this is a anti-ferromagnet. These are the leads out there, could be ferro or anti-ferromagnetic leads. And this is a molecular magnet. There are magnets available uh, exactly precisely of that form. And uh, if this is an anti-ferromagnet, then you get frustration in the uh, ground state ordering here. <coughs> Add some uh, Maria Chiloshinsky interaction to it, and then uh, there is a ground state where the total spin, let's say in that direction, can still be conserved, but you have an additional uh, conserved quantity, and that's the chirality. So there's a chirality order, either you go to the left or the right hand. And it's a coherent supposition of uh, all the free states which are possible because uh, of the frustration, we cannot satisfy that, but uh, still there's a chirality moment. <coughs> so you have a Hamiltonian like this here, and one can show then in the low energy sector that uh, this Hamiltonian uh, has uh, two interesting parts. There's an electric field which couples to the uh, parallel chirality of the system, and the coupling constant is given by an electric dipole moment of your magnet. And then there is a coupling between the total spin and the chirality, the set component of the chirality. <coughs> and so this gives you now a four-dimensional low energy space with which you can play around applying electric fields and magnetic fields and uh, uh, therefore actually turn on and off this device as a magnon transport uh, device and uh, it acts then as a uh, transistor. So that's, uh, so you couple then also the uh, chirality to the outside spin chain, little s, and uh, the same then with the total spin uh, 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 coupling to the outside. Okay, and if you go through the exercise, you can then show indeed that the current which is going through this uh, device can be efficiently turned on and off. So this is the logarithmic behavior of the current uh, for various uh, fields here. So for example, here we looked at anti-ferromagnetic chain treated as a Lottinger liquid where you have kind of the non-interacting limit and then here a stronger and stronger interacting and you see that this uh, switch on, off ratio becomes strong. It goes for both for ferromagnetic uh, uh, chains outside and anti-ferromagnetic ones. Uh, the drag is a little bit that you have to go to lower temperatures. For this uh, typical material numbers which we took were around the Kelvin or so. Okay, so you know, I just want to say there are many devices. Uh, we also looked at other kind of uh, devices, for example, uh, 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 the equivalent of a uh, uh, magnetic capacitance can be defined or a resistance uh, as a function of frequency. So here's a setup. If you have a magnetic uh, uh, particle <coughs> and you apply an AC oscillatory magnetic field to it and it's coupled to a magnetic reservoir, uh, so here is the uh, uh, description of the coupling, then you get an equivalent circuit uh, like this. And uh, in response to this driving field, the magnetization uh, on this uh, small particle here, M, D uh, can then be expressed in terms of uh, a capacitance and a resistance. And uh, what is very nice uh, to see is that if the leads are anti-ferromagnetic, you get actually universal behavior. And again, you see that the uh, uh, resistance takes this universal behavior, just the inverse now, H over G mu Bohr squared. And so that's uh, completely uh, the complete analog of a, a device where you have electrons on demand spitting out and this spits out spin-ons on demand. So it's not a random process, so you can really, uh, you know, uh, attack that uh, kind of behavior. Okay, good. So that's uh, what I wanted to say about this extreme quantum uh, regime. Uh, some of it, I come back. And now let me uh, switch gears a little bit and go to the magnon transport in insulating bulk uh, magnets. And uh, here, I would like to uh, 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 tell you now a little bit uh, what we did in terms of analogies, finding analogies between features which are well known in the charge transport and see whether they also exist in the magnon transport or in magnonics. And a very uh, old and famous uh, law in uh, electronic transport is the so-called wiedemann franz law. <coughs> and I will tell you in a second what this actually is. It's a thermoelectric property and uh, does something uh, of similar kind uh, exist here. And then superconducting state, we've heard of that. Uh, we also <coughs> looked at that as a magnon condensate uh, state, I mean, motivated by uh, <coughs> experiments by uh, 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 Burkhardt and Demokritov. And uh, also the uh, analog of Chosen effect uh, can actually be uh, looked at. So maybe, Koki, you will 
have on your slide or on your uh, poster more on that. <coughs> okay, so wiedemann franz law for bosons. And uh, at first sight, it looks actually a little bit crazy uh, to ask about this because a magnon is a boson in the simplest uh, form and an electron is a fermion. So the quantum statistics is totally different. And the wiedemann franz law is a law at low temperatures. So that means, you know, at low temperatures where the quantum statistics matters, uh, we would expect to see distinction and differences uh, occurring. And uh, that's uh, therefore not a completely trivial question. So let me remind you of the wiedemann franz law in a metal with uh, electrons and goes back, uh, uh, what is it now, 100, uh, well, almost 200 years. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm from the University of Basel. And uh, this guy Wiedemann uh, was actually professor at the university and uh, we still could get the original uh, manuscript and look at handwriting, how they did the experiment. And it was actually amazing. This is a very difficult paper to read these days because the guy was describing how he felt in the morning when he went in there and uh, you know, the <laughs> metal and he hooked it up and how the atmosphere Shut was and, <laughs> and the way they plot results. I mean, it's really amazing. And actually, when you look at everything, it's amazing that there should be universal laws in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it turned out to be true, uh, not always, but uh, you have to go to, I mean, it, it's true for, okay, so what, I, what is the law? The law is you measure in a, in a piece of metal, copper, gold, silver, whatever, you measure the uh, uh, electrical conductivity, you just apply a voltage and the current rise and you measure the, uh, the resistance and then you do the same with the thermal gradient and you get the uh, thermal uh, coefficient. <coughs> and then you take the ratio of these two quantities and uh, you hope to go to a low enough temperature and you find that it uh, 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 goes linear in temperature, this ratio. And there is a universal, so from the theory then uh, you can use uh, just simple uh, through the formula and uh, basically then the same for the heat conductivity, this is ashcroft mermin physics and uh, you find that you have this uh, universal uh, constants here, uh, Boltzmann constant over the elementary charge E. And this law is valid uh, when temperature is much smaller than uh, the Fermi temperature. Uh, Fermi temperature in a metal is typically 10 thousands of Kelvin. So that means at room temperature this is very well satisfied and you don't uh, need to worry uh, about in general about this. <coughs> and here this is called the no uh, Lorentz number. It's a universal ratio of electron charge and uh, Boltzmann constant. Uh, just yes. a quick question. Um, this law only works for electrons still behaving as gas, right? If we're looking at this reason, it's not. So, well, I mean, the law, the law holds, you know, let's say in the true deformalism, <laughs> where you assume that they are kind of uh, free particles, fermi liquid particles, and uh, no phonons essentially. So that's another reason you have to go to low temperatures. Uh, so, it, of course, you know, there are deviations from it. But uh, in some metals at room temperature, this is already satisfied. In some metals, it's not. You have to go to, uh, you know, paints to go to much lower temperatures. And if other uh, strong coupling, uh, non Fermi liquid behavior would emerge, then of course, you also get deviations from that. So, the reason they uh, the, the discover electrons in the vacuum can move uh, liquids rather than. Gas? That, does it still hold? Well, as long as it's a Fermi liquid. Oh. I mean, you know, Fermi gas, Fermi liquid for me is the same. So in, in this sense, if it's a, it's a, a lambda of Fermi liquid, then the law holds. There are even uh, more generic uh, or uh, general reasonings for that uh, based on thermodynamics. <coughs> Uh, but anyway, so what is the system now we are looking at? So I uh, pose now the question and let's see if we can find an answer. And what we look at here are, uh, is a ferromagnetic uh, system. So think of uh, YIC, yttrium, iron, garnets, and uh, we want to have a junction. So we have uh, two uh, areas here. Uh, let's call this the right one, the left one, the same material. And we just put them together so that we have an interface. This is not very crucial, but it's crucial for our calculation because uh, then the calculation is much simpler because then we can do a weak coupling expansion. This was the main reason why we did it like that. And uh, we have a magnetic field difference between here and here. We interpret this as a chemical potential difference and the same as a temperature difference uh, between the two. And we are interested now in the uh, conductance of magnons and conductance of heat across this interface and uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, conductance. Here, just very quickly, I, I flash what I mean by chemical potential. 
so we have a big reservoir, uh, could be the lattice or whatever, and uh, we have a weak junction so that when magnons flow over, then of course, you know, I start to depopulate this stuff, but because I have a big reservoir, uh, it will always keep it on this side. Uh, at the equilibrium determined then by the magnetic field felt here and by the temperature and the same on the left hand side so that this is not uh, disturbed much. Uh, you can think in terms of a kind of a, a quasi-equilibrium which is maintained. Uh, you could also think of doing some spin pumping as uh, Jaroslav explained uh, that uh, basically you just want to have a, a, a chemical potential gradient driving the magnons. Good. So uh, let's start here very quickly uh, what the, uh, uh, the technical part of the calculation is. So we have a exchange interpart between the right and the left spin at the interface and that translates in a magnon approximation which we uh, take throughout here uh, into a coupling of a magnon on the left hand side with a magnon on the right hand side, a Hermitian conjugate. And we assume that this coupling is much smaller than the exchange coupling in the ferromagnet. <coughs> and uh, we have here the uh, spectrum of the magnons, quadratic. Uh, we can also allow for a dipole-dipole term, a shift. I will show this in a moment later. But anyway, the momentum along the uh, uh, propagation direction is not conserved. It's broken by the uh, interface. Perpendicular is conserved. And uh, this uh, uh, non-conserving of uh, momentum is basically responsible then for the current. And then uh, we define a magnon current, basically the transport of a G mu bore as a magnon is created across uh, or moved across the interface and the heat transport is just the energy for a magnon uh, created across the interface. And then we look at linear response and here is the Onsager matrix, magnon current uh, driven by uh, magnetic field and thermal gradient and the same for the heat cur current and these are our uh, on cycle coefficients which we want to calculate. <coughs> and as I said, weak junction, and we can do then a perturbative calculation in this uh, uh, weak coupling here. So, okay, uh, you go through this calculation, uh, you find then, uh, uh, it's kind of uh, simple, uh, the uh, explicit expressions uh, in lowest order in the coupling, which is uh, quadratic in Jx uh, squared. And uh, what is uh, important is that the uh, difference of the uh, magnon distribution function, the Bose-Einstein distribution function uh, appears in both expression. And this allows us then uh, to perform a linear response and uh, for zero uh, thermal gradient uh, we go in linear response in the magnetic field and vice versa uh, linear response in the thermal gradient and you get uh, uh, different uh, Bose factors here but both of them uh, behave in the limit like this and that uh, immediately uh, gives us an Onsager relation between the off-diagonal elements, they are essentially equal up to a scale factor. <coughs> okay, so here is the explicit expression of all these uh, uh, Onsager coefficients and they kind of look uh, uh, reasonable. Uh, there are some uh, exponential suppression factors in there and some uh, uh, complicated temperature dependence. And now we are interested in the ratios. And uh, for this, uh, uh, this is now an important point. I come now and I will use it later again. So here again, uh, the uh, linear response relation, Onsager matrix, and here the magnetic uh, conductance defined magnet, uh, magnon current times the chemical potential or magnetic field difference, and this is the conductance here. And this is at zero uh, uh, thermal gradient, and this conductance is just a coefficient L11. But what about the thermal conductance? And the thermal conductance now, and that's very important, uh, is defined as the thermal heat, uh, this K times uh, uh, the thermal gradient. Yeah, I think it's not showing here. <laughs> Good, thanks. Uh, and we want to calculate this, or we want to find this, under the condition that the magnetization current is zero. It's very important. So the magnetization current, we calculate from this matrix here, is an expression where I have uh, L11 times uh, this delta B and an off-diagonal term times uh, delta D. And uh, the condition that this has to be zero is a condition if delta T is non-zero, I apply this from the outside, that there must be some internal chemical potential uh, built up by the magnons. It's just you drive with a heat current, your, your, your heat over there, this will also drive magnons on the other side. And the magnons start to build up and flow back. So that's neglecting any relaxation process. Exactly. So we are very low temperatures now. <coughs> So, no phonons like you, you know, ideal world. <laughs> Don't <laughs> criticize me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now I have a sticker. <laughs> I'm in charge here. <coughs> okay, so I had questions, many questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to give me five minutes. They always say <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, look. Uh, 
now you throw me off my line here. <laughs> okay, so I build up this uh, chemical potential and uh, therefore I have to stick this in when I calculate the heat current. So this is this induced one. And that means that my uh, thermal conductance now does not only consist of the diagonal part, it has also these off-diagonal elements in there from the backflow. Good. Now what does it mean? <coughs> uh, if you uh, look now at this uh, ratio of G over K, then uh, here's the temperature dependence, uh, or as a function of magnetic field, uh, scaled with the temperature, and there's a saturation where it becomes linear uh, in temperature. And the big difference now between a uh, magnon system and a fermionic system is that the second part also occurs for electrons in the electronic case. However, there it's al almost always negligible because it's temperature over Fermi energy squared. Very, very tiny contribution. But here it's the same order. It even cancels actually the leading temperature uh, dependence in the L22. And this, I think, is actually a very, very profound statement because this brings uh, magnon conductance back to the same behavior as for fermions. <coughs> okay, so uh, if you go into this uh, uh, regime, low temperature, forget about uh, phonons and so forth. So ag again, we get through this calculation the ratio of uh, thermal conductance to uh, uh, electric conductance. It's linear in temperature, and instead of uh, the charge E, we have now G mu Bohr. So the Lorentz number is here, and uh, I think the uh, the other factors, uh, the pi pi is over, uh, over something, is uh, is just geometry dependent. So it's also a universal law, and uh, for Yik, you have to go to temperatures that low. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that also means that all the transport is exponentially small. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes, nothing yeah. happens. Nothing. Except, <laughs> except when you look at the ratio. <laughs> now, of course, you know, this is a question of uh, regime and it's a question uh, what we looked at now with the coupling and so forth. But I think there are also regimes where it's not exponentially small. And there are other materials where probably it's not exponentially small. So we also uh, tested this for dipolar interaction. And uh, indeed, you know, the stuff looks completely different here if you just look at the absolute values. But again, when you look at the ratios, it uh, turns out to be exactly the same. So the dispersion relation doesn't matter. And uh, to us this was actually kind of a surprise. So there seems to be some more uh, general uh, feature uh, behind. You know, here... I have a question about the dipole. Yeah. So, so when you're taking the dipole-dipole direction, you only do that on each side, left and right, but not across the barrier, right? Okay. I mean, uh, because we have weak coupling. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. If you would do... Um, yeah, yeah, device, yeah. There yeah. would be also coupling, depending on how... Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And then uh, you can play then also the other games with, uh, you know, the Seebeck, Peltier uh, and Thomson relations and they also come out in the same way. So you cannot, from this type of measurement, you could not distinguish whether you're dealing with a fermion or with a bosonic system. <coughs> you know, for example, in some systems, in uh, chiral magnets or so, uh, spin liquids uh, signatures, uh, which uh, look like fermions are then interpreted my elementary excitation is fermionic in my, uh, in my uh, spin system. But I think this is, you know, one should be cautious with this. <coughs> okay, good. Uh, so one can test this experimentally. We looked also at three and four magnon uh, processes and uh, showed that um, uh, phonons are actually negligible. Now, I wanted really to say a few words about that, but uh, <laughs> if... <laughs> Pardon me? How many words do you want to use? It depends. <laughs> do you have a question to this? Would you be interested to listen a little bit to quantum <laughs> Hall? <laughs> Can you tell us about that slide? <laughs> okay, so uh, you know, I said in the beginning that uh, an electric field acting on a magnon uh, gives rise to this uh, gauge potential. And uh, then you can play the game that you apply here a field of that type, which is just a harmonic electric confinement. And uh, of course you get lambda levels. So it's the same formalism, there's not much thinking here, and uh, you get uh, you know, the uh, 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 equivalent of a cyclotron frequency and so forth. However, when you plug in numbers, it looks really bad. <laughs> because uh, in order to get a decent number, let's say one micro EV uh, corresponds to 10 millikelvin. <laughs> Sorry, it's very low, but still, you know, uh, in my field, that's a uh, achievable temperature. And still, uh, you need a very strong electric field a volt per nanometer squared or something like this. And that's not so easy to produce. And uh, this prompted us to think, well, is there actually another way uh, to get something similar uh, of this type here? And uh, this is, uh, you know, if you look, the effect is coming from the effect that you have a linear 
uh, relation here in the coordinates. You can also go to a gauge where you have just one coordinate changing and the other ones are zero. And what is important here is the slope. And indeed, if you uh, extend now this uh, electric potential periodically as a sawtooth, then this would mean that you don't need actually a large harmonic confinement where the uh, electric field would uh, uh, rise over a very long distance, but you could do it on a shorter distance. So we were wondering how much of the quantum hole effect remains. And this is uh, what I wanted to show you. This is uh, our work uh, in progress now where we show that uh, here we have a system with the standard flux and uh, you get the edge states. I'm sorry, it's not very visible, but uh, you can see here these uh, edge states. It's n equals one quantum hole regime. And then you add periodicity, sawtooth periodicity to your uh, potential and it essentially remains. It gets more and more deformed. In the end, it gets so deformed uh, that you could not put the chemical potential through the gap, but still you see the edge state. And once you have an edge state in there, then basically you get something which is very close to a uh, quantized value. And the meaning of all this is, in the end, you can do this with electric fields which change sawtooth-like on a very short distance. And the distance can be shorter than the effective magnetic length. This is something which uh, we found very surprising. So here, uh, in this regime, uh, the uh, periodicity is, uh, is basically of the same order as the magnetic length. And then you are not so surprised that you still see it, but even if you are below, uh, you see this gap. <coughs> Good. Now, uh, I want to say something about topological number, and then you can go and uh, look at this for the uh, thermal uh, hole effect, and the uh, implementation of that is using essentially a skirmion lattice, uh, triagonal uh, uh, skirmion lattice, and there's something we worked out with uh, Kevin and uh, Jaroslav uh, some time ago, and uh, showed then that the magnon spectrum indeed is flat here, and this is something which uh, can then serve as a basis for the quantum hole effect, and uh, this was looked at before, but now our new uh, contribution is that when you look at this uh, thermal conductance, there is this uh, second piece which is coming from the uh, uh, effective chemical potential and it's this piece which changes the temperature dependence. So if you do an, an experiment, uh, you should clearly see the distinction between a wrong prediction and a correct prediction. <laughs> and with this, uh, I think I'm partly done. And thank you very much. <laughs> Minus one. No. <laughs> so, so this electric field couple, I mean, appears in the Hamiltonian in the same way as Dolzhinsky Marina. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is uh, something uh, actually no, because this is a very old paper of mine, <laughs> and this connection has been made later then by Nagaosa and collaborators that uh, basically you can do the same with uh, Maria Dolzhinsky. But I mean, so formally yeah. written in the Hamiltonian. Exactly, minus exactly. Minus yeah, yeah. Is exactly the GM term. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it has been pointed out after our paper. <laughs> <coughs> and also, I should say that the, uh, you know, let something like this here, Skirmion lattice, is based very strongly on uh, 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 Moria Czerzynski. So, and here, you know, in this work, this is actually, uh, I think it's a very nice piece. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might, uh, you know, it's your work. <laughs> Uh, that uh, if you look at this Kermion lattice, it's possible to get an effective gauge potential out of it. And this effective gauge potential, you know, has kind of the standard form, which uh, you might think you get this here, but the average uh, of the field can even be zero because there is a uh, oscillatory part on top of it, and it's this oscillatory part which gives you a strong contribution. Probably the most uh, amazing thing is the strength of this field. It's given actually uh, basically by, uh, you know, some order a uh, number of order one over a squared. And a is the lattice constant of your skirmion lattice. And that means it's a very, very strong effective field. If you translate this back into the electric field which you had to apply from the outside, it would be huge. <coughs> so yes, I mean the Morachinsky is the way actually how to see this effect in, uh, in the system. And so I'm very thrilled now to see, you know, that this uh, skirmion system, this skirmion lattice, is, uh, they, they are available. So if you go into an insulator, and the experiment here, I would say, is simple. You go into an insulator, and you just measure the thermal hole conductance. 
There's not even driving of the, of the magnons is needed, just a thermal pole conductance. 